how we perceive ourselves or how we make an impact on the world is one of the most important things. So I think really just our our characters are all failures in their own way. And that's a good thing because it means they've learned a lot and they're and they're ready to grow and, and get better, just like we all are. I love this movie so much. I'm a huge D&D fan. I think I've seen it like four times and it fully captures everything I love about the game. Oh, that's Thank great. You. Thank you. Here. One of the things that I really love about it is the dynamic between the characters. And it seems like the cast playing D&D really helped to cement that. Was there anything from that experience that impacted the script or maybe opened the door to more improvisation? I think what it what it really did was serve as a chemistry test for our, our actors and allowed them to fall into their their roles in the film without rehearsing strictly by the book. Um, you know, very often when you have this limited rehearsal time, especially during COVID, you want to hear scenes on their feet as quickly as possible so that you can make adjustments. But there is definitely something to be said in being able to approach it in a looser, more improvisational style, not even necessarily to pull those improvisational lines and put them in the script, but just to get our actors into their characters and communicating with each other in a way that their characters ended up doing. So it was wildly helpful in that sense. I love that. And then the movie introduces so many incredible characters and storylines with like the Wizards of the Red Wizards of Day, the Emerald Enclave, the Harpers. Are there any that you would have liked to explore more in the film had you had time? I mean, they're all really cool with so much interesting backstory. But um, ultimately, you know, I think a mistake some movies in this genre do is to get too in the weeds with that backstory and you lose focus on the main journey of your character. So we tried to make all that stuff as efficient as we could. The flashback to Faye that's in the movie was actually a later reshoot, which we did because we were getting the sense from the audiences that um, they weren't clear on what Sophina and Zastan were up to. You know, we talked about the beckoning death spell, but we didn't show the consequences of it. And so, as they say, better to show than tell. So that's what we did. Um, but no, we felt like the right amount of that stuff. Yeah, well, you know, we had some extended material where we get into, you know, the Emerald Enclave and how they how they look at um, Doric and how she is very much an outsider. But it, it felt it felt like too much of a diversion from our main plot, as well as the um, the, bar the elk tribe that um, uh, Holgo belong to. We get to meet members of those that I think we have in the deleted scenes. So you'll be able to kind of see her interaction with them. And if this were to continue with a sequel, are there any actors that you would like to bring in either as a villain or part of the adventuring party? You know, we haven't really thought of it. Um, we, we've been so utterly focused on this film that, um, you know, it was, it was imperative to us that we get this one right and kind of not even focus on what comes after. And, and that's kind of where our head space is still, especially with the strike and we can't, do anything anyway yeah. what is something from this experience that you would like to bring into your future projects well certainly you know where it's relevant the use of practical effects was really mm -hmm. important to us and i think made a real difference both in the performances from the other cast members but also in the the look of the film i think audiences have gotten accustomed to so much reliance on cg effects that when they see something that harkens back to the earlier days, 80s, 90s and whatnot, it's refreshing and fun. Um, and so that's something that I think we'd want to continue. I also think whenever we're approaching a, a, an action sequence, um, to do it in a way that is fresh and subversive, um, I kind of glaze over and stop engaging as an audience member when I see action sequences that are that have been done before and there's nothing special or unique about them. So as a reaction to that, I think it's important to us that if we are kind of uh, diverting from the dialogue and, and showing people something that is purely visual spectacle, it should be done in a way that um, is different from what people are expecting or have seen before. And, 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 you know, we tried to do that with D&D as much as we possibly could with each of those scenes and definitely would be something if we were doing a big adventure picture to do the next time as well. I love the practical effects and the action sequences are some of my favorite because of like the infusion of comedy, like when they're escaping, when they're about to be executed. 
That yeah. completely killed me. That's one of my favorite oh, things. Oh, thank you. <laughs> How closely did you guys work with Wizards of the Coast when incorporating elements of like the Forgotten Realms and just kind of the visual aspects of D&D to really hone in and make sure you captured it correctly? We were very lucky to have this established lore behind us uh, that we could build off of. Um, and to have these lore masters, these experts in their field, it almost felt like we were making historical fiction where we're, we're consulting with the historians uh, who kind of know everything there is to know. So we did try to make it as, as accurate to the, to the material as we possibly could. Of we, course, had, we had an expert on set with us while we were yeah. shooting who we could talk to about, um, you know, is this, spell, what does this spell require and, and what level would it be? And that, you know, so that we really did try almost like shooting a medical show where you have your doctor on set to <laughs> advise you. So, you know, we approached it like this is all real and, and, um, and tried to be as accurate as, as the filmmaking would permit. I love that. It honestly, when I was watching, I felt like I could tell some of the times, like the dice roll that would have meant the situation, like what the consequences yeah. were. So it was That'd very great. Um, and then you mentioned some of the deleted scenes. Were there? Are, what are some of the other uh, like DVD extras that people can be really excited for with the home entertainment release? There's a cornucopia, if you will, of, uh, of behind the scenes stuff. We didn't have. Um, regular press visits because of COVID. So instead we had kind of an embedded documentary crew and they shot all kinds of pieces that are on there that are really cool and informative about, you know, the monsters, the uh, stunt work, the uh, the weapons, all different things. It's really cool. Yeah, there's some sets and creatures that you literally only see for a second or two on film, but required hours and hours of meetings and consulting and 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 prep to kind of lead up to it so it gives you a better glimpse of the things that you only very briefly see in the film uh and how it was done i mean my favorite thing as a kid was a, a show called movie magic that was on discovery and it showed how these big iconic movies like jurassic park were made and uh, to be able to you know give people um you know a, a look behind the curtain at how the sausage was made is, is really exciting for us. Very cool. And then can you talk to me a little bit about balancing, like capturing the essence of D&D without letting the rules restrict the storytelling? I mean, I think it was really from the writing stage that we wanted to incorporate and make sure we got across the the feeling of playing the game. It wasn't so much about the specific references to things in the game, but that sense of um, spontaneity of things going wrong of, like you said, of having rolled a low number. And so everything spins out of your control. And then what do you do? And so even though obviously there's nothing spontaneous in the movie, it's all planned and written, but we wanted to give the audience the feeling that they were making it up as they went along. And then we also, in an effort not to alienate non-fans of D&D, we did a, a proper noun pass with the script where if people if it felt like we were getting too bogged down with names and places that nobody who is unfamiliar with D&D would know, we, we stripped it as much as we could um, while keeping some details that we knew would kind of go over the heads of some people but not take them out of the story. I love that. And then one of my favorite moments in the movie is uh, the speech about being a failure, but continuing to fail. Can you talk about kind of like the importance of that message, just generally speaking? Life is all about failing. I mean, that is that is where we learn um, when you succeed, you don't really learn. And so to can to be able to continue to fail and to not stigmatize failure in a way that like prevents you from following the thing that makes you happy uh, is, is paramount to, to growing as a human being on this planet. You know, we have very limited time on this earth. So to be able to kind of embrace failure and, and understand things from it in a way that makes us kind of improve, whether it's how we perceive ourselves or how we make an impact on the world is one of the most important things. So I think really just our, our characters are all failures in their own way. And that's a good thing because it means they've learned a lot and they're and they're ready to grow and, and get better, just like we all are. What was one of the most surprising parts about working on this, either in the writing process or on set when directing? For me, it was how quickly the actors fell into the world um, and into their characters. You know, it, it can be incredibly 
overwhelming as an actor um, to go onto a set that is largely practical. You know, we, we tried to avoid blue screen as much as we could while there is a, a good deal of it in the film. To have something tangible, but also so alien, I think can overwhelm people. And, and, and the fact that they were so skilled enough to be able to kind of embrace it and make it part of their home is, is, a, is a talent that you don't often see. And I guess I would say that the, you know, shouldn't have surprised me, but it did was just how funny reggae Jean Page can be, um, you know, because that part is deceptively yeah. difficult. You know, you have to commit so completely to the stupid seriousness of it and never wink um, and never let on that, you know, you're a ridiculous character for it to work. And he really committed. It was fantastic. Oh, he was amazing. Walking over the boulder. I died. That is one of the funniest. Mm-hmm. I've ever seen <laughs> that that was improvised that was one of the few improvised moments that we had we just decided to keep the cameras rolling as he was walking off into the sunset that's how John- committed that's how committed he was to the part that he would walk until we told him to stop we said to each other what's he gonna do when he gets to that rock we thought maybe he'd walk around it but no jumped over it and then we kind of retrofitted that line uh from chris into edgin's mouth so that he he really kind of hones in on that moment oh my god that's amazing thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me this movie is so fantastic i watched it so many times and i can't wait to watch it more thank you now now you can own it yep (laughs)